born and raised in Louisville, Kentucky in the 80s. And, um, you know, I was, when I was born, the doctor said it's a boy. Uh, I, was, I was raised as a boy. But pretty early on, I knew that didn't fit very well for me. By the time I went to college, I, uh, I was very clear that my gender identity was female. Um, and I transitioned to living as a woman in order to be kind of, uh, in order to, to be living authentically in my gender identity. Uh, gender expression, another term you might hear, is kind of how we pr project gender and our gender identity out into the world, those kind of appearance and behavior kinds of, of things. And another term you uh, may hear is gender nonconforming, um, which can overlap with or is sometimes used as uh, different from or sometimes not from transgender. Gender nonconforming refers to folks whose gender expression characteristics or identity don't conform to gender stereotypes in some way. So they may not not identify with the gender that they were that they were assigned at birth, um, but they may feel more authentic to themselves as a, a gender nonconforming person when they're expressing themselves in a way that's not stereotypical, or they may have a gender identity that is not strictly and only male or female. So Transgender uh, so folks like myself who have that innate gender identity that's different from their assigned sex at birth. Usually, um, we, you're aware from that, of that from an early age, we may be able to express that kind of at different places later in life. And this includes transgender women like myself who uh, transition from female to from I've got myself confused now. <laughs> Sergeant Parsons has just given me a strange look. Uh, even I messed it up. Uh, uh, transgender women like myself who transition from male to female, right? I'm live as women. And transgender men who transition from female to male and live as, did I say and live as men before? Did I mess that up? I, I think you did. did I, okay. Uh, so right, transgender women who transition from male to female and transgender men who transition from female to male. I hope everybody looking at the screen has got it. Uh, <clears throat> so not everybody, not every trans person or loved one of a trans person everywhere at all times uses the same terminology. We're trying to give you an idea of terms and of terminology that in general is good to use, especially as a non-trans person. Um, and some, some general do's and don'ts. But keep in mind that um, your best practice is, is usually with an individual to mirror the language that they're using or ask them what they would prefer. And that very, very much includes uh, the, uh, the names and personal pronouns, you know, he or she or they, um, that somebody prefers. And, you know, sometimes that is obvious and sometimes you don't know uh, unless you politely this slide includes some uh, terminology that would go on the don'ts list, and I'm hoping a lot of it will be obvious. Um, maybe some of it is not. Um, these are terms you still see bandied about in the media. Um, one or two of these terms are still not that uncommonly used by some transgender people to refer to themselves in some situations. But in general, if you are not part of this community, you want to avoid it because it is offensive to a lot of people. So that's, that's the don'ts list, everything else, um, you know, that you're hearing us saying transgender, trans, gender nonconforming, these are, these are good terms to use. Brett? Thanks, Harper and Jean. So one of the things you'll notice um, as Harper and Jean and I go through this presentation is um, we've, we've taken great pains to, to think about how this presentation should actually be presented. And one of the recommendations that, that we make as part of this, if you're going to do the, the larger presentation, is that it's actually done um, in a collaborative effort with a member of the transgender community or an advocate from the community and a member of law enforcement like we're doing here today. Because you'll notice that a lot of um, the, the information that Harper Jean just presented is really sort of technical information coming from this perspective of the community. And so it lends more credibility to the subject matter that a member of the community were to present that um, in a way that, that comes from them and, and, and their, their needs, um, as opposed to the information I'm about to impart, which is 
information really intended for law enforcement. And we know that law enforcement officers around the country, and I'm sure those of you who have oversight of police officers know this, that we tend to only want to learn from other police officers. And so we would encourage folks who go through the longer uh, portion of this training that CRS is, um, is offering that um, you collaborate in the areas in which you're coming from around the country. Um, it is also important to know that this training uh, did not just suddenly appear magically. This has been a collaboration between dozens and dozens of community organizations, law enforcement agencies, um, non-government organizations, experts in the field, educators, um, and professionals from around the country. And so this is really a product of a lot of people's input. And um, we'll see a list of that at the end. Yes, they will be, they will be at the end. So here's, here's moving on with the presentation itself. For police officers, um, which is who we're targeting here in this presentation, is you know we want them to take away practical experience or practical tidbits of information that makes their job easier. So giving them information such as something so simple as when you're not sure, just ask. Ask someone in a professional, respectful, and a relevant way how they would prefer to be referred to, what name they would prefer, and if it gets down to it, what pronoun they would prefer for you to use. And in most cases, you will find that individuals are very accepting of that and, in fact, appreciate that openness and understanding. Once that is established, the member or the person conducting the interview should, should stick to that. Regardless of what the legal name is on a document or on an identification card, if the person prefers to be called by a name that's inconsistent with that, for the sake of an interview where you're trying to build rapport and where you're trying to build trust, you want to continue to use terms and names that make that person feel at ease, make them comfortable, and make them feel respected. During this training, um, in the longer version, we have um, inserted actual role plays, scenarios where we can take police officers who are participating in this training or other people who are participating in this training and give them real life scenarios. And while we, we give examples in the full training that, uh, that we provide, we would hope that local areas would use scenarios that most accurately reflect the areas in which they work. So using geography that makes sense, using terms as far as you know the parts of the city and things that make sense, so that it feels real for the participants. Um, and, and just to give you one example of how this, this might work would be you might just give them a scenario of a simple street encounter of a transgender individual, perhaps on a traffic stop, where the individual sitting in the car it is appearing to be one gender, and then the identification that the person presents to the officer clearly depicts an individual of someone of not that gender. And how an officer navigates in a respectful, professional, and relevant way, finding out if that person prefers a different name, a different pronoun, or if it goes that direction, if the officer feels like they're being deceived, how the officer goes about identifying that person in, again, a professional, respectful, and relevant way without disrespecting the individual who's in, in that car. And without making the whole simple traffic stop uh, an unpleasant interaction about the person's name and gender. Exactly. So some things that you obviously want to think about are, are you know, how do you set that tone? Are you asking questions that are relevant to the investigation? We find as we look at complaints coming from the transgender community, most of the time, they're not upset with why the police originally came. In fact, in many instances, it's because the transgender individual was the victim of a crime. So they're very happy to see the police come because they're safe and hopefully this is going to be investigated. But then suddenly, the investigation turns from not the crime that was being reported, but to the identity of the person who was reporting the crime. And that begins to set a tone of accusation, of victim blaming that we'll talk about later, and really then degrades the trust um, that should exist between community members and police. So there are a few role plays that are built into the longer version of the training um, that you know can be sort of tailored and used to walk through these questions. So we have inserted throughout the training um, some, some just thought-provoking questions that hopefully will stimulate discussion, and in fact, the way they're phrased obviously do stimulate discussion. And so 
the first question that comes up is the one that you see in front of you. And um, the this is and this is something that does come up a lot talking talking with law enforcement and talking with the trans community about how they believe that they're perceived uh, by law enforcement. Um, and obviously, hopefully, this is an easy one. Um, the answer, you know, we give it to false. Um, and you know, we talk about um, how trans people are not trying to quote unquote deceive anybody about who they are. They're in fact being authentic about who they are. They're sort of like everybody else, trying to kind of go through life, living their lives, um, you know, in a way that that reflects who they are. And um, something that trans community members report um, anecdotally in a lot of the research that's been done um, is feeling that, as, as Brett indicated, that So we've received uh, just some information that perhaps some people cannot hear us, that we need to speak up a little louder. Um, is that a consistent issue out there? We're taking a little break because we do see a note that says there's been a request to speak a little louder. Are we having technical? Of course, it would probably help if I continue to speak um, so that you knew if we were speaking loud enough. No problem here. I can hear you fine. OK, okay so on. generally speaking, you can hear us fine. Great. Thank you. We'll continue on. Oh, I'm on. Sorry about that. Um, you know, this, getting back to just the victim blaming and re-victimization, just to, 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 again, give you a real life example of how this occurs. And to a police officer, this is a very legitimate way that, that they operate. So uh, a member of the, the transgender community has has called 911, or perhaps a, a call has come in on behalf of that transgender community member, and she is in an area of the city that is known for commercial street sex work. Um, she's bloodied. She's been the victim of a robbery. And the police officer who calls for an ambulance, before asking about the lookout for who you know committed this crime against her, or before asking her if she needs any first aid, says, why were you out here anyway? That type of interaction, especially as, as, as soon as it comes, um, can immediately um, turn a cooperative and, and supportive complainant into someone who eventually may file a complaint against that officer for not focusing on the task at hand, which was to investigate um, the crime against her, the member of the transgender community. There may be legitimate reasons to focus on that. For instance, an officer may say, well, I know her from the area, and I know that she has been arrested for prostitution-related charges and failure to appear, so I felt it was important to run her name to make sure she wasn't wanted. And those are really difficult lines, to, things to balance for a police officer, because while the police officer may be investigating a crime committed against that individual, he can't ignore his experience and dealing with that individual, and in fact, that he may have a wanted person, but it's the timing of that, and it's the sensitivity with which you deal with those issues and when you deal with them, that you want to make sure that you're not immediately coming off as someone who is blaming the person for being the victim of a crime, and certainly not turning this into an investigation into their activity, as opposed to the activity of the criminal. For 
We're still with you. We're just trying to advance the slide here. There you go. And we're back. So as part of this presentation, we felt um, when we were coming together as a large group that numbers don't lie. Um, they can certainly be manipulated, and they can certainly be used for different purposes. But um, our friends here at the National Center for Transgender Equality and some other NGOs have done some really important research that, that tell an awful lot about the victimization and the perceptions of members of this community. And so those are included here, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but these numbers should jump out at you, especially as people who are, are overseeing the conduct of police departments, that when you see one person who comes forward to file a complaint or, or, or complain about conduct, that's probably just the tip of the iceberg with regard to this community, because we know through these surveys that the numbers are quite large. You know, why, why does this community mistrust police? Well, when, when I was with the Gay and Lesbian Liaison Unit for the many years I was there, I talked an awful lot about how I walked this very fine line between advocate and enforcer. And the mistrust is because, unfortunately, members of the transgender community that we come in contact as police officers are on the enforcement side. That's the contact we are having with them. We are, if we're not exposing ourselves to these community at large, only coming in contact with them when they are engaging in criminal activity. And so the bias and the, and the slant and the haze that in the police officer's eyes is every member of the transgender community then is engaging in criminal activity. And of course that, you know, that just reinforces broader societal stigma and, and images about transgender people and um, contributes to the, the perception of the trans community that they can't trust law enforcement, and the law enforcement may be uh, even dangerous to interact with. And so when you look at the statistics at the bottom of there, I think, I think those are significant numbers to know that of those surveyed, that amount of people have experienced this reality. And that reality ranging from, from people reporting, uh, some of my officers reporting harassment, and reporting uh, profiling that just by being a transgender woman of color walking in a certain place at a certain time. Walking while trans. Is yes. what we call it, yes. yes. I feel like we should have some music during this interlude. Well, we play, how many lawyers does it take to use PowerPoint? <laughs> oh, yeah. OK, so, so as, as they're advancing the slide, um, to give you just a little bit more background on this presentation, um, CRS is um, in the midst of finalizing this PowerPoint that is going to be going up on the website and be available. Um, throughout the world, on the World Wide Web, and is going to be putting out more information on how organizations like yourself can access this training. And then obviously through your work with your local police agencies that you work with, we would hope that you see this as a beneficial product um, to assist you in educating the officers in the jurisdictions that you work to, in the end, cut down on the number of complaints to help the police department become a police department that is a, a collaborative police department that is treating this community with respect and dignity, and one in which um, really cuts down on a lot of the work that you and the police department have to do following up on these types of complaints. And these are just some, uh, some of the examples of specific questions from some of the role play scenarios in the, the, longer, uh, in the longer training. One of the things that we try to really reinforce again and again in this training is, uh, as, as Brett said before, the, uh, the respecting a person's self-identification, using la the language that is respectful, including 
uh, gender pronouns, he or she or they, that, that uh, conform to how a person sees themselves or what they, how they say they want to be, uh, want to be referred to, um, as well as thinking about what are best practices for things where we are used to, where law enforcement are used to thinking about gender. Now, departments may already have clear policies on this. If they don't, maybe she, they should look at it. But, and things about physical searches, particularly when someone is taken into custody, there may be rules about searching um, and who does the search of a male versus a female individual. And the best practice that's, that's developing um, in law enforcement is to think about asking the person if they would prefer to be uh, searched by a male or a female officer, especially in any situation where normally there would be a rule about in, in, in requiring a same gender search. So a lot of agencies have policies about that and many other issues, including use of names and pronouns and, uh, and uh, questions about identification. Um, we encourage uh, folks to work with, uh, we encourage departments to look at those, uh, to look at those areas, develop those best practices and as needed uh, policies. Uh, but to keep in mind the general idea of using your, your interviewing skills as a law enforcement officer um, and treating the individual the way that if you were in their position, um, you would want to be treated uh, by someone in a uniform. And we really encourage proactively engaging with the community um, in the, the ways that uh, law enforcement interacts with, um, uh, with, with other communities. So I'm oftentimes asked by, by law enforcement um, administrators and, and chiefs of police, you know, do we need to have a liaison unit for something like this? And, and the answer is really, um, depending on your agency, depending on your area, it may or may not be beneficial. But this I know. I know that you do not want to be making these decisions and, and coming up with these policies after the crisis happens. And so having law enforcement professionals and police administrators and leaders look at these issues now, before the crisis happens, before that lawsuit, before that complaint, before that major media event occurs, so that these relationships are already established with members of the community and you know who the community leaders are, you know what the issues are, can really go a long way in, in mitigating some of the really bad things that happen as a result of a lot of these complaints that come in. And of course it's important to think about how to do that, how to create those relationships. If, um, you know, it's probably good to talk to someone at first and let them know that the department would like to send some uniform officers to the annual observance of the Transgender Day of Remembrance, which, which remembers transgender people who have been victims of bias-motivated violence. Um, that because of the, 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 the lack of trust, the, the bad uh, history that we've talked about, uh, there can be real apprehension about uh, seeing folks in uniform. And so even making contact to say, hey, you know, can we come to you, your events and, and sort of meet and, and be out there and connect with folks and what is the right way to do that um, can be really helpful. And then also supporting educational activities and initiatives on both sides not just educating police officers about this community, but also educating members of the community about law enforcement and, and so that they understand what the policies and procedures and what their rights are. Because an informed community is oftentimes a community that is most supportive and can come to your defense in some instances where they read or they hear through the grapevine about alleged misconduct and if you've already educated them about how officers are supposed to respond and they read about it and they say, well, wait a second, that sounds like exactly what they were supposed to be doing. Um, and, and you've already nipped that issue in the bud by making sure that your community is educated. Conversely, from a civilian oversight perspective, this kind of community, community engagement may help folks feel more empowered to file those complaints when it is appropriate. And as you can see, we just had a whole bunch of people involved and groups involved in this. And uh, to pick anyone out would, would really not do justice to this. Um, the, the collaboration that occurred and the levels of expertise and passion behind this subject were just amazing. The word historic was used a lot. Uh, that being said, these are by no means the only uh, experts
efforts out there in law enforcement or in the LGBT community that folks could work with on doing this training or doing community engagement with the trans community. There are a lot of other folks out there who are helping um, CRS roll out this, this training locally, but this was the big group that, that really helped put this uh, together on the front end. So at this point, I think what we're going to do is uh, open it up for questions. So thank you. We've been speaking with Harper Jean Tobin, who is policy counsel for the National Center for Transgender Equality, and Sergeant Brett Parson, former commander of the Gay and Lesbian Liaison Unit with the Metropolitan Police Department of the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C.'s primary law enforcement agency. And this last slide has contact information for the Community Relations Service. Uh, CRS, as we're known throughout the country, has 10 regional offices and four field offices strategically located in communities, cities, and towns throughout the country for the intent of providing services to local communities in a way that enables them to understand the sentiments that exist in a given region, as opposed to doing the work here from Washington, D.C. As such, if there is interest on the part of any of the participants about working with CRS to actually conduct an LG or a transgender law enforcement training, uh, please just call us at the number that you see on the screen. Uh, we'll uh, just refer you to the office closest to your particular location, and then from there we can begin working with your local law enforcement agency, Human Resource Commission, or other entity, and the community to address some of the things that have been covered here today. At this point, if you do have questions, please just send them, and uh, we'll just uh, have Harper Jean and Sergeant Parson begin answering them as they come forward. Um, we had one question that was about a specific fl slide that we're going to go back to, but in the meantime, um, I wonder if Sergeant Parsons wants sure, to that bottom one. Absolutely. So the question was, uh, when is the appropriate time to integrate these lessons into officer training, in the academy, ongoing, or remedial? Um, and the answer to that question is yes, uh, all of the above. It, it, is, it is best to, of course, immediately when you start to train police officers, start making sure that these terms, that these communities are part of just everyday jargon. They should not be um, surprised when they see this when they come out of the academy. With that said, it should not be a one-shot deal. It should not be one, two, three, four hour or eight hours class that they get in the academy and then they never hear about it again. So using in-service trainings and roll call trainings, annual in-service trainings, incorporating it into other annual trainings like firearms training or perhaps domestic violence training and bringing LGBT related issues into those trainings that go on throughout the year are also great ways. And then of course, you're going to have people that break policy or do things that are inappropriate. Obviously, disciplinary action is necessary in some of those instances, but remedial training may be necessary, and so you may need to do that sort of thing um, to, to backtrack and, and send people through again to make sure that they've received the proper training that they should have gotten to begin with. And so you want to make sure that this is something that, that is being done on a regular basis. In just the same way that you would with, with other uh, you know, with other diverse communities, particularly diverse communities, that there's a, a particular need to kind of build uh, real relationships or address distrust uh, with. We're talking about a small but significant segment of the population estimated to be 700,000 transgender adults in the U.S., as well as a population of thousands of, of children and adolescents who are increasingly coming out as transgender. Um, at, at younger ages. So these are folks in every community. They're part of the fabric of the community. Um, every age, race, religion, uh, background, profession, and so on. Um, and so people, you know, uh, officers are, are going to interact with, with transgender folks. And so that's why that sort of all of the above training approach is important. So we received another question that Gil will address, and that question was, is the Department of Justice considering developing a similar training for departments of corrections or for officers in jail and prison contexts? And I'm assuming that the officers aren't in jail, but the 
words. They mean in the context of corrections. That, that's what we would hope. So obviously there's a tremendous need. One thing that we've seen in our work across the country is that sometimes the most critical issues involving law enforcement and transgender community have to do with custody and jailing and so forth. So in that sense, we do know there's the need. Um, now, keep in mind, the Community Relations Service is an organization that helps communities and local law enforcement work through tensions. So when it comes to jailing and housing people, um, again, we know that they're critical issues, but we would probably turn to our sister or cousin agency, the U.S. Department of Justice Bureau of Prisons, to be engaged in that type of uh, training being developed. So the answer would be essentially we do not at the Community Relations Service have plans to do so. We know the need is there, and um, we may very well be turning to other entities within the Department of Justice to address that issue. And let me point you to where there is some of those resources already is part of the, a sort of part of the Bureau of Prisons, which is the National Institute of Corrections, which is essentially a, a kind of uh, clearinghouse and almost think tank on corrections within the federal government. They have put out um, a policy review and development guide for corrections agencies um, regarding working with LGBT and intersex people. Um, and they are, uh, have also done some training broadcasts that are archived on their website and a whole bunch of other resources on their website. They're working to develop more. So it should be easy to find the LGBTI resources on the National Institute of Corrections website, and that is a great, great place to start. I, I would also add, this is Gilbert Moore from the Department of Justice, that we didn't talk very much about custody issues. Um, and I've seen Harper Jean and Brett do a similar presentation and they've talked ad nauseum about that and uh, about all the sensitivities that exist there. So it is a very significant and important issue in discipline and one that I would encourage you to follow up with uh, based on the resources that Harper Jean just shared. So we have another question that's come in. And thank you, by the way, for these questions. They're, they're rolling in. Um, where should oversight go to start the process of building a bridge with the transgender community locally? Well. This, this starts with, with all members of government, really not just police and, and, and law enforcement, but also you and the oversight community. And that is, the first thing you have to do is identify who and where your community is. And, and that's one of my first questions anytime I'm called by a chief of police who is thinking about starting a liaison unit. I ask, do you know the community leaders? Do you know where your community socializes? Do you know where your community holds their events? Do you know who the organizers are? And if you don't have the answers to those questions, you need to start doing some research. You need to reach out to those people. You need to start extending a hand and let them know this is an issue that we think is important. We want to learn more about it. And the way that we think is best to learn about it is to build a relationship with you. And what you will find is that those community members that you contact will bring other community members in, begin introducing you to other community leaders, and then the larger community becomes sort of infected with this feeling of, trying to build trust, and that's the best way to do it. And, you know, who are those first people that you can engage with um, is going to depend on where you are. In some places, it may be an LGBT community center, it may be a transgender advocacy organization, it may be a, so a social service organization that has a lot of experience and competence dealing, working with trans people and has trans people on their staff or their, their, their volunteers. Um, uh, it, it may be... Um, you know, through if there's any kind of LGBT liaison in a larger city um, or county government. Uh, there are a lot of different places to start. And I think what's also important is keeping in mind, no one or two people or organizations that, that you engage with is going to necessarily represent the whole community. And I think it's really especially important to try to engage and hear, to engage with folks who, who, can, who can speak to um, the experiences of um, folks in the trans community who are the most likely to have interactions with law enforcement, and that, of course, is, is lower income transgender people, transgender people of color, uh, transgender uh, immigrants. Um, but, of course, it also is everybody in the trans community. Um, but just, which is just to say that, you know, contacting with like the one local like transgender support group that's all like middle-class, middle-aged, white, transgender women is a good, maybe a good place to start, but it's not necessarily where you want to finish in terms of engaging with that, that whole community. Sure. So we have uh, several questions that actually um, 
are specifically about the training itself, uh, some te technical questions. So you should know that, first of all, um, this training has been designed, the full-length training has been designed to last about two, three hours uh, generally, and that depends on the number of speakers that you might have available. It depends on, obviously, the availability of, of uh, classroom time and, and the group, you know, the particular agency's availability. Um, whether or not video is used in there, is, it can be customized in each area. And so uh, depending on the speakers who might bring resources themselves, they may use videos as part of the presentation, and there's time for that. And then lastly, um, how do you get a copy of this? The first thing I would encourage you to do is, is obviously to reach out to the CRS website uh, surrounding this issue, but also in each of your areas you have a regional coordinator for CRS, and they have all very recently um, been um, been acclimated to this, have been presented this um, this program, and so they are now available to serve as conduits for this training. So I, I would also add that when we provide this training in communities, we do it with an intent. So whether or not it's as a result of an unfortunate incident that's taken place or whether or not there is just an unmet need, what we try and do is actually get together representatives of the local transgender community to help support in the presentation. So a part of this is informing law enforcement, but what we actually hope will also be an outcome is building the relation, developing the partnership. And we found in our work over the years that it's somewhat undeniable once you bring parties together that uh, may not be familiar with each other or if they have opposing views depending upon some of the work that's going on, that the first step in, 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 in in establishing a relationship is bringing people together and developing kind of uh, an understanding of the different perspectives that exist. So that being the case, ideally when we provide the full training, we do so with the intent of developing the relationship. So we have a shorter preview version of the training that we will make available, but we would ask that uh, anybody interested in taking advantage of the full training that they would work with CRS's regional offices to do so rather than just using the PowerPoint independent of our process. That much said, if you remain interested in the PowerPoint presentation that you've seen today, you can definitely give us a call at 202-305-2950. Uh, That's 202-305-2950, and we'll make sure that we get you a copy of this preview version of the presentation. Call today and get a free gift. That's right. And now back to our program. <laughs> so um, another question that's come in deals with um, how uh, asking for a recommendation on how to deal with people who are literally in the midst of transition. Um, so for instance, you have uh, an individual who's come to you regarding a complaint, and that individual, as part of your intake process, has to provide an ID or perhaps fill out a form, and it, it, it does not... Um, it, it is not consistent with what their government ID is and, and how you deal with that. Well, this is not something that is unique, of course, to oversight agencies. Uh, the courts deal with this. Law enforcement deals with this. Every organization and business out there deals with this on a regular basis. Um, so I want Harper Jean to, to address this initially from the community perspective, then I'll tell you what we're teaching officers. Sure. Um, I, I think a couple of realities that this points to. One is that Gender transition looks different for everybody. It doesn't have a, a single sort of beginning, middle, and end. That um, and I think the narrative generally is that it's you know it's a process that's all about medical treatment, um, and there's a definite endpoint that is usually thought of as being about some um, about specific kinds of surgeries, um, and that's not really how it works um, in the in the in the real world and in, in real healthcare and in, in real people's transitions. Um, there's a lot of different factors that affect the, the medical care that people need, uh, seek, and, have, and are able to access. Um, and all of those, as well as other parts of what gender transition looks like, really are different for everybody. So there's not necessarily a final step for everybody. And then, with regard to ID, we have a real patchwork of different state agencies, different states, different government agencies, as far as changing names and genders on documents. So it's quite common for transgender people to not be able to have updated some or all uh, of the ID that they have, and they may in fact have different documents, an I, a driver's license and a birth certificate, and a passport, say, and a social security card, that may have 
differing names and genders on them because of the different hoops that they either were or were not able to jump through uh, based on where they live, their economic situation, their medical situation, and so forth. So that's kind of the reality that, that kind of leads to this. So what happens from a law enforcement perspective is that an individual, if they're coming into contact with, with law enforcement as a um, as a an offender, um, is eventually going to be fingerprinted, and and that fingerprint is going to connect through either a state or a national database, and they're going to be positively identified. And in most jurisdictions, that identification related to that fingerprint is going to be based upon their first contact with law enforcement. And so let, let's use Harper Jean as an example, just hypothetically, that when Harper Jean was 18 years old, she was arrested for some sort of a traffic offense while she was still, before she had transitioned. And, and so when she was arrested at that time, she used the male name. She used her original birth name. And then subsequent to that, 10 years later, she does something and she gets arrested post-transition and those fingerprints are run and it comes back and Harper Jean says, my name is Harper Jean and here's my ID, it says it's Harper Jean. And the police officer looks after the fingerprints come back and it comes back to this male name that Harper Jean hasn't even told the officer about because that's not her name anymore. She doesn't use it anymore. And so this creates some tension with the officers and you know, is, are you being deceitful or using AKA? When it's really explained quite easily that our databases really serve as a repository for just ongoing information and intelligence. And so it is not uncommon for any person to provide you know, different names. Sometimes those names are due to marriage they change. Sometimes they're due to just people not using a, a junior or using a, a different name as they go on in life. And I would just encourage members of law enforcement to stick with the difference between the official name that is identified because of fingerprints only when it's necessary and really when you're dealing with an individual in an interview situation or a conversation go with what is most respectful and professional and what's going to get the most cooperation from them. In yeah, I, I think that's right. In terms of the mechanics of record systems, I mean that's very, very locally specific, but I know that there was there was a, an instance here in, in with one of the law enforcement agencies in, in DC where there was an issue where there was an idea that if somebody was in custody before they transitioned and then they were in custody after transition, that they couldn't then treat people according to their post-transition gender because they had to follow what was in the computer system. And obviously, that's just too mechanistic, right? That doesn't make any sense. And it's uh, rigid. too rigid. Um, and, and that was something that they had to, that they had to change uh, recently. But, um, I, I, we'll leave it at, at that for now so we can get to some of the other questions. There's a question about mediation and whether complaints of mistreatment of trans individuals are appropriate for face-to-face uh, -face mediation and should mediators have special training on these issues. Uh, um, of course, uh, CRS also uh, does uh, mediation conciliation work. Um, and I think the answer is it depends. I mean, imagine that you're looking at some other kind of bias-related incident um, based on race or based on membership in a religious minority, um, it might depend, and it would probably, uh, one of the biggest factors would be, you know, what, um, what does the, the person, what does the person who's been affected, who's made the complaint say, um, you know, what do they want to have happen? I mean, in general, I would think that the, if you have good principles for how you do mediation, including in bias-related incidents, including in misconduct or, or use of force incidents, um, that, uh, that you know, the same would generally apply here, um, where there may be you know, issues of mistrust, of discrimination, of stigma, um, and, and fear related to all of those things. It's not necessarily fundamentally different than with other, other groups that may, may, have, you know, may report experiencing those things. So we, um, we have about five minutes left. We have one more question and then a couple of just housekeeping issues here. Um, the next question is, uh, do law enforcement agencies permit or recruit members of the community, I assume meaning the transgender community? And I, I can tell you that um, speaking locally, um, I am aware of many individuals who have either become police officers post-transition or have transitioned on the job. And while they've had varying degrees of acceptance and their experiences have been um, sort of 
on the spectrum of, of acceptance and, and um, that sort of thing. Um, I can tell you that uh, here in the Washington metropolitan area, um, we have seen many members of the transgender community part of, part of law enforcement. With that said, um, I think it's more of a local question for a lot of your agencies as to whether or not they recruit. Um, and so I can't, I can't speak to that as far as the national trend. But certainly having a diverse force um, is desirable for a whole lot of reasons. And um, well, in the past, you know, we saw a lot of law enforcement agencies get complaints or lawsuits of discrimination by transgender officers or applicants. Nowadays, I think agencies are, are working proactively to, to have, you know, equal employment opportunity for this community. And I know the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department recently became the first agency to have a, a really published, uh, comprehensive, written policy on um, uh, transgender officers and what trans transition on the job looks like. Um, if you are interested in working with your agency to be ahead of the ball on that, uh, that's a model you could look at. So um, wanted to remind all of you that if for some reason you missed something uh, part of this webinar and you wanted to hear it again, um, it was just that good, that this is being recorded and will be on the Nicole website, which is www.nacole. Dot org, I think, because the slide just left me. Um, and then I also wanted to provide you with, again, the contact information for CRS, which is at the end of this presentation, because someone asked to see that number again. So we'll leave that up for a moment for those of you that wish to uh, get that number again, or go back to our, uh, our deep-voiced uh, announcer here with that number. So thank you, Brett. And for anybody who would like to uh, be in contact with CRS about this training or about any of our services, you can reach us at our headquarters office at 202-305-2935. That's 202-305-2935. And we'll make sure that we connect you with the regional office that is closest to your city or town, and we'll be able to provide you with the services that hopefully you are seeking. On behalf of the National Center for Transgender Equality, I just want to thank uh, CRS, and uh, Sergeant Parsons and uh, Nicole for having us. Um, it's uh, really great to, to work with and, and talk to folks who are, are, um, are uh, you know, want to work on these issues. Um, uh, we believe very much in civilian oversight and uh, we hope it's useful for you. We hope this is useful for you. So thanks. Thank you for joining us. Thank you again to Harper Jean and uh, Brett for joining us today as well as you, Gilbert Moore. Um, I think this has been incredibly beneficial to all of us who have been able to participate today and I hope that those of you who were on the um, part of the webinar today are able to take advantage of the full training at some point in time. Um, on behalf of NACOL, I thank all of you participating. You will be receiving a uh, follow-up survey uh, in the near future with a, just a couple of questions that help us uh, know how this uh, worked for you. So again, uh, if you do want to watch this again, please visit our website, www.nacol.org. You are correct, Brett. Um, and uh, you will be able to watch the presentation in its entirety there. So again, thank you very much. And we hope that you will uh, join us again sometime.